I guess, boss run here. And today let's talk about my top 10 uniques from the rework in 3.19. So if you don't already know, there has been around about 124 uniques reworked in the rebalance of unique items here in 3.19. And uh, there's a few that got removed. There's a few that got incorporated from Prophecy. And I went over all of these over on twitch.tv slash pastor on, on my live stream just to see if I missed something. And basically what I realized is there's a lot of fluff in there, a lot of leveling stuff where we would just be saying, oh, this is good for leveling, that is good for leveling. So I didn't decide to make a video about all of them, but there were some interesting ones, including some that people aren't really talking about. So I thought, why not make a top 10 video to kind of incorporate them? Uh, so let's go for it. Also, I want to preface that I did not just consider power level. I also considered what I would maybe be interested in building around. Um, it's more like a list of interesting uniques, I guess, and not necessarily the most meta ones. Number 10 is this is the only leveling item that kind of made it onto the list. That is the Tier of Purity Unique Amulet. And the interesting thing about this is they basically changed the requirement of the level from level 20 to level 5, and it now provides up to 20 all attributes and up to 10 all elemental resistances. So the biggest thing about getting this amulet down to level 5 is that it gives you a level 10 purity of elements. Now, that is kind of a big deal because you can put that on on level 5. So what will that result in? Well, a level uh, 10 purity of elements gives you 26 all elemental resistances. Put on top the 10% that you get anyways. You get a little bit of life. There's actually a lot of life at level 5. You get 20, up to 20 all attributes, which is just crazy. And most important than anything, you get ailment immunity. I think this amulet is a serious contender for anybody who wants to use Karui Ward. Uh, if you're somebody who wants your leveling to be a lot more cozy and you're fine with losing 10% move speed from Kaori reward, uh, this amulet is completely insane. Number nine, Maroi Urki. And no, I'm not trolling. This is actually a very interesting weapon. I don't know if it's going to be good, but it's quite interesting what they've done to it. So they basically removed the whole pulverized stuff to make it less shoehorned into, for example, a melee build. They gave it 25% reduced attack speed and minus 500 accuracy. Now, there's a few things where this can fit. So what they did is they removed the 30 to 40 physical damage and gave it 400 to 500 increased physical damage now just to give you a little bit of an insight here this is how how this would look like at perfect stats you have a uh, flat damage of 706 to 1058 that number is mind-boggling and for stuff that doesn't actually care about your attack speed where you can basically ignore the abysmal attack speed uh, like for example battle mage where you use it actually for spells um, or maybe slams or ignite this can be really nice. Now, obviously for slams and ignite, it would still feel bad overall, especially for slams. Ignite, it might be a thing, but um, it would be hard to make work. Mostly this is, I think, just very, very interesting uh, for battle mage. You also don't have to be inquisitor if you decide to be non-crit. You can also use the cardigan's crown. Overall, do I know if this will find a home? Well, I know quite a few spells who would do very, very well with this amount of flat damage in the end, if it will actually be viable. Something I also want to mention is you can actually corrupt maces into level 10 inspiration, which could be very interesting for spellcasters. Number eight, we have bronze life. So what they changed to bronze life is basically they made it so the 15% attack and cast speed, if you've used a movement skill recently, is gone. They did increase the damage from 50 to 100% increased damage. Um, but the big thing that they changed is it now has plus five to level of socketed movement gems and not just plus two. And this is a pretty common unique, so it will be quite easy to just double corrupt them as much as you want until you get like a plus two, plus three, or even plus four. And what you can do, for example, is scale lightning warp quite high. The lightning warp POB that I checked last time uh, more than doubled its damage by using this chest, which is very interesting. Then again, a lot of these clear speed uh, spell builds would probably rather have impulsas. But then again, when we're talking about double damage, it's just quite interesting. Now, um, I will also say that for stuff like Flame Dash or Frost Link, builds that are on the fringe of being a meme or being okay for mapping, uh, those kind of builds will just be really, really strong. Um, we'll get enhanced quite a bit by this chest, I would say. So, we still have to see if this is just going to be a meme chest, if it's going to be something that people actually want to want to play. Overall, um, Bronze Life, the rework just screams fun to me. Then we have Emperor's Vigilance, and oh boy, is this shield interesting. So what they did here is they removed the 10 to 15 max life, uh, and they removed the cannot block while you have no energy shield, which is very nice. But then the big buff is it now has a 1000% increased armor and energy shield, previously 300 to 400. Now, first up, in a league where divine orbs are now going to be extremely expensive, just having straight up a 1000%, no questions asked, no rolls, no nothing, 
is incredible, but what exactly do you get? Well, let's look at it. I put it in here, basically a thousand percent increased armor and energy shield. So you're looking at 1,870 armor and 392 energy shield. Now you might say, oh, well, okay, but Aegis Aurora still exists, right? Uh, but number one, we don't know how rare this is, so it could just be a very, very strong stepping stone until you get Aegis. And the most important part is, this is actually incredible with shield skills. It really pays off to have a lot of armor on your shield skills, as you can see right here. Let's take, for example, uh, Shield Crush and Spectral Shield Throw. They give you added physical damage per armor or evasion on the shield. So that is huge. But furthermore, you also get Critical Strike Multiplier per Maximum Energy Shield if you have Phantasmal Spectral Shield for or Divergent Shield Crush. There's also still the Seething Theory Viridian Jewel, which gives you even more Critical Strike Multiplier and also increases your base crit. Uh, overall, I think the shield is going to be the new best in slot for basically shield skills. I don't even know how good your shield or if it's even possible to replace this in one of those builds. Um, depending on how rare this is, it might actually make shield skills viable at leak start. I have no idea. Um, we're going to have to see, but overall, I'm looking forward to this. Number six, Lightning Coil. Uh, Lightning Coil basically got only one change, and that is it previously had 30% of fizz damage uh, from hits taken as lightning damage. Now it is 50. Now, just to give you a little bit of context why this is so crazy, if you have a Lightning Coil, which is 50% of fizz converted to Ellie, you get, on top of that, Chieftain, that's 70%. Taste of Hate, that's 85%. And then a Helmet with the 8% Craft plus 7% Implicit, you're at 100% of Physical taken as Elliot. What that means is you just reduced your incoming Physical damage by 75% because now all the Physical damage also goes against your Resistances, which is an absolutely absurd defensive layer. And you don't even need to go Chieftain. For example, if you have a Watcher's Eye with any Purity mods, you can get to 100% even without this. I'm just saying it's actually quite easy, even for Leak Start, and you can negate stuff like Abysses even. Uh, you can completely uh, skip Determination, any sort of Armor stack which is especially strong in a meta where uh, it's harder to fit in more auras because the 50% mana reservation efficiency mastery got deleted. Uh, so overall, I just think this is going to be an extremely strong endgame chest. There's two more chests though that I think are even crazier, which are going to come later. So that's why this isn't higher on the list. Unique body armors are actually extremely competitive this league. But other than that, um, Lightning Quell will be a defensive powerhouse. Number five, Moku's Embrace. Now this ring basically got its fire damage and its chance to ignite removed. Instead, now it basically has all damage taken from hits can ignite you, uh, which is very nice. It's basically a source of self-ignite. As well as that, as long as you're ignited, you get 25 to 40% increased attack and cast speed while ignited. Now, other than just another enabler for self-ignite, this also gives you a ton of increased attack and cast speed. Now, attack speed is usually easier to come by, but cast speed certainly is not. Now, one thing I want to point out here with Moku's, if we look at the wording as it is right here, it says 20% increased attack speed while ignited, 20% increased cast speed while ignited, and this will be transferred to 40%. And the fact that they're separated is actually important because there is a skill that actually makes it so your cast speed also counts for your attack speed, and that is the anomalous kinetic bolt increases in reductions to cast speed applied to attack speed at 50% of the value. Now, if you scale this quality higher and higher, for example, with a awakened enhanced stuff like that, you can get this to around about 80% quality, even a little bit higher. And then you can see here increases in reductions to cast speed applied to attack speed at 200% of the value. So now with this ring, you would basically get 40% cast speed, which goes to 80% because it counts double, and then 40% attack speed on top, making this ring basically insane. It gives you 120% increased attack speed. Um, this is something that might come up in the new league. I don't know. There's also some other stuff that we're going to talk about with Fulcrum. Overall, I'm pretty excited what we can do with the new Mokus, and it might even be something that I'm playing as my second or maybe third build. Then we have Sunblast. Now, this belt is extremely interesting now. So what they did in preparation for the rework of this belt is basically they removed all the reduced trap duration that you could get anywhere, so it can only occur on this belt, so you cannot stack this to 100% anymore. Uh, that used to be a thing, but you cannot anymore. Uh, it has 65 to 75 reduced trap duration now instead of 80. It got its trap damage removed. It got its mana regeneration removed. You might think, wow, that's a big downside. What is happening here? But it grants you skills which throw traps throw up to 
three additional traps. So instead of one trap, you're throwing four, which is completely out of this world. It won't it won't really help you too much with like pre-firing against bosses, but for any mapping scenario or anything that kind of survives your initial spree of traps, this is completely mental. It is basically a 300% more damage multiplier. Completely out of this world, but the downside is quite huge because your traps don't explode immediately anymore. They're basically now transformed into sort of grenades, meaning they kind of have a delay. So at 75% reduced trap duration, which is a perfect roll, which is going to be hard to get because the vines are not going to be used on items like this anymore. Um, you have one second delay. Now, I don't think that's that big of a deal. For example, Explosive Arrow has a one second delay. Um, it just happens, right? You have totems, stuff like that. Um, I don't think it's too big of a deal, but overall traps are also thrown randomly at, around the target location, um, similar to cluster traps, which I think makes this a prime contender for something like, for example, spark traps, which doesn't really matter where it, where it explodes. It always kind of deals the same amount of damage or ice traps as John Grone tried it already. But in general, I think this will spawn quite a few builds and it will just feel fantastic whenever you can actually throw four traps at once, especially while mapping. Number three, we have Val Caress. I already talked about these gloves pretty much in depth. What they now give you is instead of plus two to socketed Val gems, it now gives you plus five and it gives minus five to level socketed non Val gems. Um, it also gives you 20 second onslaught. Number one, these are low level gloves. They're quite good for leveling. Uh, a 20 second onslaught is nothing to scoff at. But as for end game implications of these gloves, I want to draw your attention not to the level of Val skill gems, because it doesn't matter if you are using the Val portion of the skill. If you, for example, have a Val haste, that means that the haste as well as the Val haste get plus five. So as long as there is a Val version of a certain skill or aura, you can give it plus five by just socketing in the Val version. This minus five basically only works for stuff that you maybe would throw in like support gems or something like that. This also kind of makes it so you can't put Empower on top. That's basically what they wanted to do with this. Uh, something else, I mean, with gloves, you can get a plus one on top. You can get plus twos on top. Um, I just think these are going to be quite interesting for, for example, some of the Aura Stacker builds. I think at really high investment, uh, Shaper Gloves will probably win out over this. Uh, but before that, I mean... Just a combination of extremely strong gloves paired with them also being extremely strong while leveling. I just think these have to be on the list. Number two, the Covenant. Uh, when I saw this unique body armor on stream for the first time, I did not really understand what's going on. I thought this was kind of like a prank. Uh, maybe I missed a line or something. So basically what happened to this is it doesn't have the blood magic effect anymore where you spend uh, life instead of mana, which was a very strong effect. Uh, but now it has uh, socketed gems are supported by level 29 added chaos, previously level 15. So as a small downside, now you have to pay both life and mana. But just to give you a little bit of an idea what a added chaos damage level uh, 29 actually does, this is what it is. It is 377 to 565 added chaos damage. As a comparison, this is a level 6 awakened added chaos damage. It has 195 to 293. So basically, a level 29 added chaos damage is double the damage of an awakened added chaos. So before I saw this chest, I was kind of thinking about Poison Ballista. I wasn't really sure. The damage was kind of there, kind of wasn't. And then I look at this body armor, I pump it into my POB, and I see more than double my damage. I was like, I, I don't understand. I just actually do not understand. Giving certain builds, especially attack-based builds, such a huge amount of just unconditional flat damage is insane. I think that this chest will completely dominate the early league and basically make a lot of builds viable that weren't viable before just by going poison and throwing your main skill into a covenant. And number one, there it is. Um, pretty clear winner here. This, I don't know what they were thinking with this chest, but it's going to be one of those things that everybody is going to hunt for in endgame, uh, Diala's Malefaction. So let's go through the buffs together. Diala's Malefaction. Now, number one, um, gems can be socketed in this item, ignoring socket color. So what you can think about this chest is basically, it doesn't matter what color uh, they have to, you can always socket that in, but depending on what the color of the socket is that you put it in, you get different effects from that gem. So number one, gems socketed in red sockets have plus one to level. This got buffed to plus two, right? Let's put that in here. So what you could do here is get six red sockets and all your gems simply get plus two, which is what, for example, Skin of the Lords does. Um, so that is already crazy. If you have an Empower in there, that means everything gets plus four. Uh, 
Now, gem socket and green sockets have plus 10 to quality. This got buffed to plus 30. So what that means is stuff like, for example, Phantasmal Spark, which used to need a Ashes of the Stars perfectly rolled, which is now going to be even harder because of Divine Orbs being so expensive. You can now just throw into this chest. And at the end, also, they buff the experience. So I guess you could level some gems with this. Not really too interested in that, but also kind of cute. But what I want you to show is just how crazy this can get. So a lot of endgame spell-based builds are either you're running Skin of the Lords or Skin of the Loyal. It gives you 100% global defenses. It can maybe give you a keystone. Usually not that big of a deal. Um, but it gives you plus two to level of socketed gems, which also counts for your support gems, which makes it basically double dip with an empower support. Now, right out of the gate, without even thinking about anything, this already gives you plus two, which once again, double dips with empower to give you plus four. But the huge difference between this and Skin of the Lords is Skin of the Lords comes corrupted. Now, obviously, Dialas doesn't have the global defense, doesn't have the keystone. But if you can corrupt it, you can get another plus one level right here. And you can get, for example, plus two on top, whether that's duration, AoE, or whatever. So let's say your main skill is an AoE skill. You can now get plus two, which also counts for empower. That's plus four. It gives you plus one, which also counts for empower, which is plus six, and then plus two to your main skill again. That is a plus HS. And that is without even thinking about the 30 quality actually being able to completely replace Ashes of the Stars from a lot of builds or stack some of the builds that already were stacking quality with Awakened Enhance and Ashes of the Stars even more and put this on top of those. I think this is actually a completely crazy endgame chest and your new default, if you don't know what to do with your double corrupt, uh, I think honestly that this is something that most spellcasters will be striving for. Uh, for endgame, plus eight, that is absolutely not a joke. The quality could enable completely new builds. As I said, you can stack a ton of quality on certain gems. But that's just my list. What do you think? Is there anything that I left out? I'm sure there is, right? Uh, going through all of these, there's some really interesting ones, right? Like uh, Honorable Mentions, Ephemeral Edge, which definitely gives Energy Blade a run for its money. There's some weird ones like the Fairgrave's Tricorn that makes it so Tormented Spirits can affect you. Overall, I'm pretty damn hyped. Um, I definitely underestimated how they would buff some of these uniques. A lot of them are just leveling fodder, but then... Uh, once again, there's like this diamond in the rough, uh, but uh, yeah, see ya. But that's it for the video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up, and if you haven't already, subscribe. As always, a huge shout out to my Twitch subscribers and my Patreons. I couldn't do videos like this without you. Thank you so much for the support, and yeah. If patch notes actually make me want to open POBs again, that's a good thing in my book. Uh, 3.18 was pretty disappointing in that department. This patch, even though the skill changes are a little bit disappointing, definitely delivers on the unique sides. A lot of these are going to allow for some playstyles that weren't really that viable anymore. Uh, but with that being said, since I still don't have a slogan, see you next time.